Welcome to the Catholic Foodie Show. I'm Jeff Young, your host, the Catholic Foodie. So glad that you could join me today. It is Monday. It's a bit drier today than it has been the last several days here in uh, South Louisiana. You may have seen on the news or, or heard, uh, as I shared on Friday's show, that we have had some uh, pretty pretty nasty weather coming our way uh, or came our way uh, uh, on Thursday and Friday. Uh, Shreveport up in the north, north Louisiana, uh, was hit very hard. And matter of fact, the system that, that came through has uh, resulted in unprecedented flooding uh, kind of all over in, 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 up in, the, in north Louisiana but also uh, down here, right here in my own backyard. Uh, it's been pretty amazing. You know, we've been through Katrina. Katrina was uh, a number of years back and it, it really devastated the whole region. Uh, and this, this, even even with Katrina, we, we didn't see flooding the way we have here. Um, it's really kind of hard to, to express or to explain. I do want to say, though, that uh, that we're okay. Uh, there there were some casualties uh, in the in the state uh, with the weather over the weekend, uh, but but we are okay. Uh, we have not had any flooding here at uh, at the Catholic Foodie residence, uh, but but the area has suffered tremendously. And I do certainly want to ask your prayers uh, for all those impacted by uh, the storms. Uh, St. Joseph uh, Abbey and Seminary College, my alma mater, I graduated from St. Joseph Seminary College, but uh, the, the college itself is a seminary college. It's, it's on the grounds, on the property of a Benedictine uh, monastery, uh, St. Joseph Abbey. And uh, they are right there on uh, alongside, their property is alongside a, a river. And that river did uh, breach its uh, banks. Uh, the, the, it, was, it was completely cut off. Uh, uh, the roadways were cut off. Um, there was no flooding in the, in the Abbey Church itself, uh, but there was a, a tremendous amount of, of uh, water damage, uh, flooding uh, in, in the classrooms um, w- with cars, uh, the, the seminarians' uh, cars uh, where they park uh, was underwater. Um a lot of the buildings, uh, the monastery, uh, a lot of the workshops, and just a lot of water. There, there are pictures I, I posted over uh, on Catholic Foodie, uh, the Catholic Foodie page on Facebook. If you go to facebook.com slash Catholic Foodie, you will see some of the pictures there. Um, just a, so sad, so sad to see the, the devastation uh, caused by the, the flooding. And your prayers really are uh, appreciated. I know that uh, the cleanup over the weekend, uh, when, when the water started to recede on Saturday, uh, folks tried to, to get out to the Abbey to assist there. Uh, a lot of good good people. You know, a lot of good things happen when 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 bad things happen. Have you noticed that? Uh, sometimes it really can. Bad things happen and it brings out the best in us. And uh, just people rally. You know, they rally and they, and they go to help. They go to help others uh, who are worse off than themselves. And we saw that on Saturday, that not only at the Abbey with, with people flocking out, out there to assist the monks and the seminarians, but also uh, even in, in, our, in my own parish, uh, St. Peter Parish in Covington. Uh, one of the things that they wanted to do was to try to pull people together in the community. Uh, you know, you had some folks in the, in the parish and even not just the parish, but the wider community too. Some folks have, have suffered and are suffering greatly. And and others haven't, and and but are willing to to assist in whatever way they they can, and so. Uh, the parish uh, organized an event uh, for noon on Saturday. The Knights of Columbus cooked because you know it's always got a food's got to play a part somewhere, right? Uh, we always <laughs> come together around food, and uh, the Archbishop uh, Archbishop Amond uh, was present at St. Peter's, using that kind of a, a, I guess, as a, 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 a what do you got a home base? Maybe uh, I know a lot of times when the Archbishop comes to the North Shore, his home base is really the the Abbey, uh, but the Abbey was uh, in a accessible. It wasn't easy to get to even when the, as the water started to uh, recede. Uh, But uh, St. Peter's, he could be there and kind of use that as a, as a command center to find out what's going on and to, uh, to, to, to be with the people, you know, to be with the people right there in the middle of, of what's going on. So crazy, crazy, crazy flooding. I mean, to, to see areas uh, all along uh, this this stretch of South Louisiana uh, on the North Shore of Lake Pontchartrain across from New Orleans, uh, to see flooding that it has never seen before, never been documented, never been recorded, that we have had flooding 
uh, like this, uh, even even with Katrina, even going back to like Hurricane Betsy, all those tremendous hurricanes that caused so much damage throughout this region uh, in, in years past, we never saw the flooding that we saw this past weekend. So that's kind of crazy. Please do keep us in your prayers uh, for that. You know, it also, we never lost power here at uh, at the studios, the Catholic Foodie Studios, which allowed me to kind of catch up on a few things. Um, I have uh, some friends who have recently been featured on television, on EWTN uh, TV, At Home with Jim and Joy is the show. And uh, I had friends, two, two sets of friends, two married couples, um, recently uh, were featured on that show, were interviewed, and uh, I got a chance to, uh, to watch those uh, while I was at home. Couldn't go anywhere, you know, kind of locked in with the, uh, the weather, but we, we had electricity. And so I could, I could catch up and see my friends on, on TV, but the faithful traveler, Diana Von Glan, her husband, David were featured, uh, the, just this past week on, uh, at home with Jim and joy. It's available at EWTN.com. You can go there and, and watch the shows on your computer. They're recorded. They're there. Uh, they're, at least they're there right now. I don't know how long they keep those up, uh, but fantastic interview. You can learn more about uh, travel and our faith and, and pilgrimages and what pilgrimages have to do with with uh, growing in faith and how it can impact our faith. Uh, Diana and I uh, and David, we, we have spoken many, many times over the last couple of years. Uh, we've, we've done radio interviews together. We've done shows together. Uh, we, we've become friends over the last couple of years. And really all of that centered around what? It's it centered around pilgrimage. Uh, with my trip to the Holy Land, I went to the Holy Land in 2014. Shortly after uh, Diana had just got Diana and David had just gotten back, and right before Diana went back a second time to do uh, a, a show on um, the Holy Father and his visit to the Holy Land, historic visit, which is going to be airing. That show is going to be airing. That new series will be airing on EWTN, I think, in May. Uh, but in addition to Diana and David Von Glan, also uh, my friends. Uh, Gary and Eileen Zimak uh, were also on at home with Jim and Joy. <laughs> so I got to see a lot of Jim and Joy and I got to also see uh, some of my friends. But again, EWTN.com, you're going to find those shows over there right now. You can go uh, uh, check it out. Check it out. Watch them. Uh, it's a lot of fun. And uh, these are good people, good people with great stories, great stories that could help. I know they help me to grow in faith, certainly helped me to grow in faith and also how to maybe practice my faith in very real kind of concrete, tangible ways in my own life with my family, in my parish, with my friends, uh, at work, you know, all those things that, that are so important to the real life stuff, real life stuff. And speaking of real life stuff, you know, part of real life, uh, is, uh, well, I guess kind of a, a struggle, you know, we're in this period of Lent right now. And, and Lent is this time where it's this, this 40 days. It kind of harkens back to that time when, when Jesus spent 40 days in the desert and what was he doing? He was battling Satan. He was battling Satan. He was he was fasting and praying, and uh, and Satan came to tempt him, and and so we have this connection between Jesus' experience in the desert and also the the ancient Jews, right? There, forty years in the desert. There's a link there too, but we really have that 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 uh, connection with Jesus in the desert, and in this forty days of Lent, where we are experiencing too um, some, some, something of a of a desert experience, and and hopefully it helps us to kind of reflect on the fact that, you know, our life is a journey to God. It's a journey with God, but it's a journey to God. And, and on that journey, on this like kind of desert journey, you know, we too are tempted. We too uh, struggle. We too are called to faith, right? We want to have faith in God. We want to believe God and believe in God. But at the same time, we know that on a daily basis, we struggle with that. We have a hard time. Uh, we all uh, uh, fail. We all fall. We certainly don't do it um, perfectly, this thing called the Christian life. Uh, but today we, we have a, a, pri- a, a we have a guest that is going to join us uh, the second segment today, Dr. Paul Thigpen. I was going to say we are blessed. We're privileged to have uh, this guest today join us. He is the author of a book that is called Saints Who Battled Satan. And I know Satan is probably, you know, you, we start talking about the devil and it, it could be kind of like, oh my goodness, what, what, are you, what are you talking about? But I, I do want to introduce him 
uh, right now. I'm so excited to have him on the show with us today. Uh, you know, have you ever noticed that sometimes it seems like everything in life conspires against us when we want to draw closer to God? I know that that, that uh, happens to me, but Dr. Paul Thigpen will join us in the next segment to share some hope and encouragement from the saints. You know, he's the author of, as I mentioned, Saints Who Battled Satan. And uh, he understands that just as in the New Testament, you know, that in our Christian journey, in this in this journey toward God, journey with God, that daily we encounter three obstacle, obstacles, uh, the world, the flesh, and the devil. Yeah, you know, I received a review copy of uh, Saints Who Battled Satan. When I saw the title, my first thought was of like the Exorcist movie, you know, and all these extraordinary encounters uh, with the devil, those kind of stories that make me feel uncomfortable to be alone at home at night. <laughs> But uh, I can happily say that this book is so much more than that. You know, I don't know about you, but I've never really encountered a demon in real life. But you know what I have encountered on a daily basis, I still encounter, is temptation. So Dr. Paul uh, shares the story with us of 17 saints, 17 saints who battled Satan and who, uh, who conquered, who conquered. And, and so he, he shares with us in this book uh, stories that really do bring hope and encouragement to us. You know, Dr. Paul uh, Thigpen is is amazing. He, he's the editor uh, for Tan Books. It's a Catholic publishing company based out of Charlotte, Charlotte North Carolina. Uh, he's an award-winning journalist, a best-selling author of 40 five books. It's just absolutely amazing. And I'm, I'm, I'm privileged to, to have him join us today on the show. Uh, we do have to take a quick break, but when we come back, Dr. Paul will be with us. So stay tuned. Don't go away. You're listening to the Catholic Foodie Show here on Breadbox Media. We'll be back in just a minute. Welcome back to the Catholic Foodie Show. I'm Jeff Young, your host, the Catholic Foodie. So excited today because we have a guest here, a fantastic uh, gentleman, good Catholic man. Dr. Paul Thigpen is joining us today, an author who has uh, authored many books. And uh, one of the most recent ones, I'm, I'm so excited about this book. It's called Saints Who Battled Satan. And, uh, you know, we don't talk about the devil a whole lot uh, these days, it seems, but uh, we need to. We need to. We, we definitely, the, the scriptures warn, you know, warn us that we have uh, enemies in this life, uh, the world, the flesh, and the devil. So the devil's got to get some attention. And we're going to talk about uh, that today and some, get some wisdom from the saints too. Dr. Paul, thank you so much for joining me here on the Catholic Foodie Show. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here, buddy. God bless you. Well, this is uh, it's not necessarily a light topic, you know, when you talk about uh, uh, the devil. What was it that sort of inspired you to, uh, to, to write this book? Well, uh, you know, I was, I was actually uh, a teenage atheist. <laughs> I was a, an atheist for six years as a teenager. And um, during that time, uh, still had kind of a hunger for things that were beyond, you know, the normal part of life, the, the everyday part of life. And, um he ended up getting into the occult, even though I didn't believe that there were any spirits or anything like that. I thought maybe, you know, that if scientists hadn't discovered yet some powers of the human mind that did things like, you know, that I heard reports of levitation or, you know, things that would go on with Ouija boards and that kind of thing. And I got involved in that, kind of trying to study it, uh, and uh, ended up encountering some things that were were not powers in my mind. They were separate uh, spiritual entities. They were um, they were malicious. They were out eating my lunch. And uh, it, it really drove me back. It was not the only factor of my conversion, but it was one major factor because it, it drove me kind of back to the scripture. I remembered, okay, when I was a kid and I was in a tradition that memorized a lot of scripture, I remember stories from the Bible and the Gospels of Jesus casting out unclean spirits, these evil spirits. Um, maybe I ought to go back there and read that again. <laughs> maybe there's something there I can learn about what's going on because my, my little atheist worldview was falling apart. And uh, this is a very powerful thing. And, and since my conversion, after that, I did some mission work in Europe, um, saw some amazing kind of preternatural phenomena there that were demonic, and have seen similar things again even after my conversion to Catholic faith 23 years ago. And combine that with what you were saying, that people talk about him so little, and yet he, uh, he's the enemy of our souls from ancient times. He's, he's after us. It finally just occurred to me, you know, we, we, somebody needs to be writing uh, more about this. I, I wrote a book called the Manual for, a Manual for Spiritual Warfare 
that gives the basics. But then this book, Saints Who Battle Satan, kind of uses the lives of the saints to illustrate the principles of that first book. And the response has been great. People are saying, I've been needing to read about this. Yeah, that's, uh, uh, you know, I do have that book, by the way, the Manual for uh, Spiritual Warfare. That's a powerful book, a uh, powerful book. And what I love about uh, Saints Who Battled Satan is you've got stories in here. You know, and I, I know from myself, stories seem to speak louder than than almost anything else. Well, they do. You know, we relate to them. Uh, they're personal. They flesh things out. Sometimes an idea can be hard to wrap our mind around, but in a, a personal experience is much different. We we can usually can connect to it right away. I think it was Pope John Paul II, Saint, Saint John Paul II, do, who once said that in, in our generation, um, people are much more likely uh, to listen to people who share their experience than the people who just kind of teach theories. Yeah, that that that's uh, that is certainly true for me. I know. Uh, you know, the whole topic of um, of evil spirits, you know, can kind of be off putting. I think to to some people. I know that um, I, I can relate to some of your story. You know, uh, I remember being. I had a conversion experience when I was sixteen years old. Um, I you know grew up Catholic, uh, going to mass and all with my my, my parents. But uh, I had I had an experience of God. Uh, at the age of 16 that uh, led me to understand very clearly that there is a God um, and that he loves me, you know, personally. And, and, and knowing that, that Jesus, you know, and, and the, what we know about God and the scriptures and, and, and the church and the sacraments and what that's all about, that all of that is true. That That's what happened to me when I was 16. It was a incredible uh, experience and really did change the, the course of my life. But when I look back, I remember, you know, you're a teenager. I'm a teenager, you know, 16, 17, 18 years old, trying to figure out what life's all about, trying to figure out what God wants me to do. And I remember back then after, as a younger teenager, having dabbled in some of that occult stuff, tarot cards and, and just really fascinated with the spiritual world. I remember um, kind of struggling with that and asking, asking questions. And I had a dream. I don't know. I guess it's a dream. I, I, I don't know what it was, but it was the, the most real dream I've ever had. I'm 45 now. And, and this is one I had about, about 17 years old. And it was clear as a bell and it involved, uh, it was a, an evil spirit in the dream. And I remember that at the last minute before I would have been devoured by this entity that, uh, Jesus stepped in and the, 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 the demon vanished, but Jesus said something to me and, and, and it's, it stays with me today. I, I, I honestly, out of, out of all the, the years, this one dream has is more real than anything else I've ever dreamt. And he said this, mm-hmm. he said, know your enemy. And that was it. <laughs> That's all he said. And, and I woke up right out, you know? So I don't know what that means other than the fact that uh, I think it's important. And I think the, the book that you wrote here uh, is important because we do have to know, right? It, it could be you know, uncomfortable, but we do have to know. Well, it's interesting. You know, that's the that's the name of the first chapter of the Manual for Spiritual Warfare. I wrote, "Know Your Enemy," the first rule of warfare, <laughs> and uh, and that's why the scripture you know, says to us that your your enemy, see, he's like a prowling lion looking for someone to devour. It's, they're not telling us that so that we'll think, "Oh, how nice!" <laughs> you know, the scripture tells us that, so we'll be on our alert. So we'll be uh, we'll be aware that the enemy's doing that, and so we have to understand the strategies. And uh, and I think too, it's important for people to realize when we're talking about spiritual warfare, we're not just talking about the kind of spooky, preternatural stuff that that Hollywood likes to make so much of. That stuff does happen, and when it does happen, it's very real. Um, you talk to exorcists and the stories they can tell you of what you know what they've been through. Um, the church calls that the extraordinary activity of the devil, but there's also an ordinary activity of the devil, and that's something that everybody has to to face, but basically every day. You can sum it up mostly in one word, and that's temptation. Mm-hmm. That he will do to us what he what he did to Eve in the garden. Uh, he will do to us what he tried to do to Jesus in, um, in the wilderness. He will try to get us to disobey God, to turn our back against God, and he has a whole variety of ways that he tries to do it, by intimidating us and threatening us, by seducing us, by you know trying to... to uh, hold out something that's good in itself, but to get us to disobey in God in order to get it. He'll do it by accusing us. He'll do it by putting doubts in our minds, by lying to us. And in all those ways, that's one of the things that you know, I love about the saints is they, 
they encountered all those kinds of assaults from the devil, and they show us how to how to win in that kind of a battle. And you have a great, uh, great compilation here of saints. I'm just going to read off a few of them. Uh, St. Joseph, St. Paul, you know, Our Lady, of course, uh, St. Anthony uh, of the Desert, St. Benedict, you know, love St. Benedict, St. Dominic, uh, St. Catherine of Siena, St. Francis of Assisi, Ignatius of Loyola, uh, Teresa of Avila, uh, St. Jean Vianney, so many, uh, Padre Pio, right? Uh, Pio of Pietro China. Uh, so many awesome, awesome saints. And I have to tell you, I, every year, we have a big thing down here in New Orleans called, uh, uh, well, it, they're St. Joseph altars is what we call them. But sure. for St. Joseph's Day, we have this big tradition because of all the Sicilian immigrants uh, that, that, that at one point the, in the, or, it was the late 1800s, uh, the majority of the French Quarter was actually Italian. And so we mm-hmm. have this mm-hmm. great tradition of St. Joseph. And so every year I'm talking about St. Joseph altars, and I mention this. The fact that the, the, the title of St. Joseph I love the most is St. Joseph, Terror of Demons. And that's, that's what yeah. you talk about here in the book. Comes straight from the liturgy, uh, you know, from, from the litany of St. Joseph. He's called Terror of Demons. And even though we know so little about him, uh, you know, in my chapter about him, I wanted to put him there because of that title. Um, I, I think we can, you know, speculate sounds like he's too frothy, but I, I think that we can kind of draw some conclusions from, first of all, the little bits that we know in Scripture, and putting that together with the, the typical strategies of the enemy that we also know from Scripture and from experience. So, you know, if we, if we want to look at all right, how would he have battled and overcome the enemy in his lifetime, well, let's look at some of the circumstances when the devil would have, would have almost certainly tried to tempt him. Um, putting thoughts in his mind. Think about when he first found out that Mary was going to have a child and it was not his child. What would the enemy have said to him at that point? Mm. You know, can't you just hear it? Joseph, she's betrayed you. <laughs> Joseph, she's not faithful. She ought to be stoned to death. At the very least, you ought to mm. send her away. Mm. You can find someone else. I mean, just think of you know, those things. And but, but how does Joseph respond? The angel tells him, this child is of God. So he can either believe the devil or he can believe God. And he does the same thing that Mary, you know, that Mary does. She believes God. And the thing that Adam and Eve didn't do, believe God. And so by his faith in God, he, he chooses the right way and he wins that battle. And then again, think, um, you know, think when he has the, the second uh, angelic dream where uh, God tells him, Herod's after the child, you've got to flee to Egypt, go. And the scripture tells us he got up in the middle of the night and he went. Um, Think what the enemy would have said to him in that occasion. He said, oh, Joseph, this is crazy. You can't do this. You don't know anybody in Egypt. You don't have any job waiting down there. It's dangerous on the road. There are thieves on the road. You, know, you, you don't know the language. You've got to at least wait and tell your, tell your family members back in Nazareth. Can't you just hear it? Oh, Anything man. to try to get him not to go so that the baby would be killed. And instead, Joseph's instant obedience. Instant yeah. obedience. God told wow. me to do this. I'm going. It's the middle of the night. Mary, wake up. <laughs> oh, my Get goodness. the baby. We're going to Egypt. That, that, wow. That's what incredible. obedience. That's incredible. It really is when you when you stop and think about those little details that I think, I mean, they're not there in the scriptures, but they're human. They make sense, you know? And those are and some of the, the things that we, we forgot. The strategies he used. He would have used those with Joseph, too. That's right, because I, we all experience that. We all experience yeah. it. Well, we do. We do need. We're coming up on a break right here. So, uh, you, can you stay with me through the break? That'll be great. I can't wait. All right, you're listening to Catholic Foodie Show here on Breadbox Media. I'm Jeff Young, the Catholic Foodie. We'll be back in just a minute. Welcome back to the Catholic Foodie Show. I'm Jeff Young, your host, and we have today Dr. Paul Thigpen, awesome, awesome uh, author, uh, uh, a man of faith who is sharing with us some some information that we really need. We really need. He's got a book out right now called Saints Who Battled Satan. And, uh, you know, it may not be a comfortable topic, but I think it's a topic that we, we do need to address. It's something that we all face in life, these temptations uh, to, to not believe God, these temptations to, uh, uh, to maybe run away from the faith, to run away from God. And we, we fight that, I think, in our, in our families. We fight it internally in our own hearts. And so, uh, Dr. Paul, again, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm so, so pleased to be here. Thank you for the invitation, Jeff. 
And uh, you know, before the break, we we're talking about St. Joseph and uh, just some of the, you know, those those very human details, those things that, that you know, when we're tempted, we're tempted to maybe um, not believe God. Uh, we can kind of use our imaginations and, and see how St. Joseph in his life may have gone through something similar, you know, with temptations, and yet he held fast to uh, to God. You know, some of the, the saints that you share in here, I'm thinking St. Benedict in particular, uh, have, I guess you'd say— um, more ostensible, uh, if that if that's the right way to say it, that uh, examples of maybe b- battling Satan in their lives is that right? Oh, they do. And again, you know, not everybody's going to have the the, the preternatural stuff that goes on, the stuff that's kind of beyond the the natural. But uh, Saint Anthony of the Desert, is, you know, supreme example. Saint Patrick Peter is another, but um, where he actually had the demonic powers would actually assail him out in the desert, taking on the forms of wild beasts, and, and he was physically uh, assaulted and uh, found and thought dead at one point. They brought him in, were having a wake, basically, for him. <laughs> and he, he opened his eyes and said, I'm still here. That woke him um, up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that'll, that'll do it. And, and so, you know, most of us are not going to, thank, thank God, are not going to uh, have that. But but part of what, what I try to show in each chapter with each saint is how they did, though, have the interior conflicts that we have, too. So, for instance, the, the temptation for him after going through all that, and, and at the end of one session, it was the second session when the same kind of thing happened, and he just went through so much torment with him, and all of a sudden, finally, heavens, you know, kind of break open, the light comes down from heaven, and they all scatter. Mm. And it sounds so familiar, you know, to me anyway, say, Anthony says, Lord, <laughs> here you are now, but I've been going through all this battle all this time, where were you? You know, where did you come? And... And the Lord says, no, I was with you the whole time, Anthony, but I had to, I was testing you to see how you would respond. And that's such a wise thing to remember. You know, somebody has said before that, remember that uh, the teacher is silent during the test in a classroom. You know, the teacher is always silent during the test. And, uh, and so that's a good lesson to learn from him, that when we think we've been abandoned by God, he's right there with us. He is. And he is even helping us in ways we don't know. But the temptation will be to despair, to give up and say, God doesn't right. love me. God has abandoned me. And uh, that's, I'm sure, what the enemy was probably whispering that to Jesus on the cross, you know. And when he, when he says you have abandoned me, he's not, he's not saying that he's lost faith. He's actually quoting a psalm that ends in, in an affirmation of faith in God. We don't have the whole psalm there, but it almost certainly would have said the whole thing. So that's part of what happens. The enemy, you know, he doesn't have a, like, like all angels, he's a fallen angel, he doesn't have a physical body. And most of the time, when we get a thought from outside our minds, we get it by way of our senses. We, we see it or hear it, you know. Uh, but, and that's how we know it's not our own thought. But the enemy doesn't have a body. He mm-hmm. can communicate directly to our minds. And that's part of his stealth strategy. He will put thoughts in our minds that we, 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 we have those thoughts and we think, well, that's my own thought. Right. I didn't, come to, I didn't read it. I didn't hear it somewhere. That's my own thought. We own it. Uh, when we shouldn't be owning it, you know. So he'll say, you know, you're you're hopeless, mm. or, or or he'll put it in first person. You know, I'm hopeless, and we'll say, yeah, I am. I'm hopeless. <laughs> or or uh, your husband doesn't love you. Take up, you know, that that offer that your boss gave you to take you out to dinner. Go take it up. You know, he he likes you, and those kinds of things. And we'll think they're our own thoughts, but they're not. So half the battle is recognizing that when these thoughts come to us, they're from outside of us. They're not our own. And right. to be able to do what Jesus said you know, in the wilderness, to come back at them and say, no, that's not true. And, and even to quote the word of God to show that they're not true. Yeah, I was thinking about that too, with, with uh, like St. Dominic, you know, St. Dominic, the order of preachers uh, known for well, the, the slogan, uh, Veritas, you know, for truth and, and standing on the, the word of God and, and, and preaching the word of God. That That's definitely one of those, uh, I guess you could call it maybe a tool that we have that could help us in our daily lives when we're tempted. Well, it is. I mean, Jesus gives us the example in the wilderness. The enemy comes, and he doesn't try to argue with the enemy. You know, he doesn't try to debate him. He doesn't try to... Uh, he just quotes scriptures. So, you know, the Word of God says, um, you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. You know, you do not worship anybody else. Or, um, and, and that's a powerful thing for us. It's one reason why we need to learn scripture, not just hear it, but sometimes memorize it. Um, um, the, the enemy will come to you, as he, as he did to some of these saints, and try to to, uh, to bully them through fear, you know, saying, you can't do this. You're not, you know, you're not strong enough to be a saint. You're not strong enough to, 
do the religious life. You, you, you'll get so hungry fasting, you'll never make it. You know, kind of <laughs> and then they have to come back and say, you know, no, the Lord's my life, my salvation. The Lord, uh, um, I have bread that you know that, that you don't even know of. It's to do my Father's will, or whatever the scripture may be that we come back with. Um, and it's so powerful to be able to turn it, you know, to turn the words back on the enemy. And uh, he, he says, "Be afraid," and we say, "The Lord is my shepherd; I shall not want." He makes me lie down. I mean, Pastor, you, you quote the whole mm. thing and say, "Even though yeah. I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, right. I won't be afraid." Because he's with me. <laughs> Powerful stuff. Well, you you know you you share the stories of of seventeen seventeen saints here in the book. Is there is there one uh, that really spoke to you? Oh wow! You know, each That's one of them has question, a different huh? thing. It's so, <laughs> so powerful. I love it. Um, the uh, the ancient desert fathers and mothers used to talk about how how important humility is. Um, when Saint Paul talks about our armor, uh, the armor is the virtues that we have. Mm. Because if um, you know, say, for instance, the enemy wants to tempt you to pride, if you have if you have developed humility as a virtue, then his his little temptation won't have any power over you. Uh, same with you know lust. You have you, if you develop purity as a as a virtue, the lust won't have any power over you. So it becomes our armor. It's like he throws the dart. Enemy throws the dart at us. The fiery dart, as the scripture calls it, and it falls to the ground. And so um, Saint Anthony and, and a lot of the others of the desert used to talk about how how important humility is that way. And I do have a, a favorite story. And it's even the saint is unnamed. He was one of the ancient desert monks, but it, it illustrates that example. And I, I give it in one of the uh, one of the chapters toward the end, but. We were, there was this particular monk out in the desert in the ancient times who um, who was a very humble man, and so the enemy was after him to try to tempt him to be proud or vain. And so what he does is he comes to him like an angel of light, looking like a, you know, a good angel, like the Scripture says that they can do. And he appears in the man's cell in his little room while he's praying and says the equivalent of, you know, oh, you great man of God, I've been sent from heaven to you. <laughs> Waiting for the man to say, oh, me, really? Ooh, I can, <laughs> God says me from heaven. But the man was so humble, it didn't even touch him. It was hardly even looking up from his prayer. He says, you know, that can't possibly be me. Go check the guy in the next cell. <laughs> what a great story. So, and, and, and the, the enemy says the equivalent of curses is foiled again. Um, and just Disappears. He couldn't touch him because the man had his armor with his humility. Oh wow! Um, and uh, it's that you know you see that in the saints so many that they their humility, their obedience, their instant obedience, their um, their faith in God, great faith in God, so that when things aren't looking good, the enemy's trying to tempt them to despair. That's what they stand on, and that's mm. that's their armor to protect them. So if we had to answer, if we had to say like you know here are two or three things that you could do today to try to um, uh, uh, strengthen yourself against uh, attack, you know, against temptation. What, 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 what few things could we do concretely today? Wow. Well, if uh, if you have access to confession and you haven't been recently, that's always a good thing. It's I call it, it's like a field hospital on the on the battlefield. Uh, if if we have fallen, if we are wounded by sin, we go there for healing, and it's so important. But also to receive the Eucharist. That is, uh, Saint. I love this is a, a quote from Saint. John Chrysostom in the 4th century, love it. He was talking one time in the sermon about how powerful the Eucharist is and how what happened at, at the cross, the Calvary, was the definitive defeat of Satan. It's the one moment in history he hates the most and most terrified of. And when we receive communion, we're at the foot of the cross of Calvary, right there in the Mass, where that sacrifice, that one sacrifice from 2,000 years ago comes forward through time, or we go backward through time, whichever, and we're there, we're mm -hmm. present. He said, and in light of that, when you take, receive communion, and you go, you leave the altar, and you go back, you know, to where you came from, keep in mind, when the enemy, the evil spirits look at you, you look to them like a lion who is breathing fire. Oh, wow. Wow, what an image, you know? <laughs> and so, go to, go to Mass, get the, you know, receive the Eucharist. It terrifies your enemy. But also read the Word of God and learn it. Um, you know, that's an easy thing to do. And pray, pray, pray. All the, all, they all talk about, I think it was St. Bernard, it says basically, if you'll just pray, you will win. It's the, pray, the prayer is the one thing that will conquer. Mm. And St. Uh, John Vianney talks about, if you fail to pray, you're sure to lose. Oh, the wow. enemy... Uh, he, he, you know, he's, he's never so terrified. St. John he says the enemy is never so terrified as when he sees us on our knees praying. Oh, and those are those are concrete things, concrete things that we could do even today. 
to help yeah. protect ourselves yeah. and, and to grow in faith and love uh, of God. Uh, Dr. Paul Thigpen, thank you so much for joining me here today on the Catholic Foodie Show. It has been a pleasure. Where can people find uh, more out uh, about you and, and, and also find the book? Well, I have a website of my own. It's up at paulthigman.com. I really need to update it. But uh, but for the, the books, especially both the ones we've talked about, the manual and this one, uh, they can go to their local Catholic bookstore. They can go to tanbooks, T-A-N, books.com, uh, or they can go to amazon.com and find them in any of those places. Awesome, awesome. Thank you again so much. Thank you, Jeff. God bless you and all your listeners. Awesome. Thank you so much again, Dr. Paul. And we got to take a quick break. You're listening to The Catholic Foodie Show on Redbox Media. Don't go away. Welcome back to The Catholic Foodie Show. I'm Jeff Young, your host, The Catholic Foodie. Awesome, awesome conversation with Dr. Paul Thigpen last segment. Uh, what, a, what, a, what a pleasure. What a pleasure. What a joy. I do recommend the book, uh, Saints Who Battled Satan. Uh, it may be an ominous title, but uh, it's something that I know that I find to be very helpful for me in my daily walk with the Lord, my daily life, my daily life of prayer, my daily life of faith uh, helps me to, uh, well, it gives me hope and encouragement, right? Hope and encouragement and wisdom wisdom from the saints to help me uh, to say no to temptation and to say yes to God, to grow in that faith and that love and that joy uh, with God. And I think you'll find it helpful too. You can find it as Dr. Paul mentioned, uh, it's Tan Books is the publisher. You can find it at uh, Catholic bookstores. You can find it uh, on amazon.com. And I believe uh, uh, Tan Books has it on their website that you could order from them directly too. Uh, links will be in the show notes over at Catholic foodie.com. So I'm excited about that. Uh, let's see. I'm also going to put links in. I mentioned at the very beginning of the show about uh, the, the at home at Jim and Joy. Uh, my friends who were interviewed, uh, Diana and David Von Glan, also Gary and Eileen Zimak. Uh, I will have links in the show notes too over at catholicfoodie.com to help you find that uh, uh, those interviews very easily. Now, I want to share a few more things with you today on this wonderful dry Monday. Uh, rumor has it, rumor has it that rain, more rain is on the way, but we're going to try to enjoy this dry weather while we can. Uh, let's see, a couple of things I wanted to share with you. Uh, uh, first of all, did you know that Audrey Assad has a new album out? It's called Inheritance. Uh, I am just enthralled with the music of Audrey Assad. Same, same could be said of Matt Marr. Uh, I love his music. I find it to be something that really draws me into prayer. Uh, music does something to us, I think. Just like good literature, good stories can really kind of bypass the brain, which sometimes works uh, overtime uh, to edit out good stuff. Uh, it, 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 and it, good stories can kind of bypass the brain and really get to the heart, you know? And I think music does the same thing. Music can really bring us to places that we can't get without it. And I know uh, for prayer, Music really does help me to enter into prayer. And uh, so the music of, of Matt Marr, I, I just absolutely fantastic, really helps me to kind of surrender to God in prayer. And the music of Audrey Assad as well. And uh, her new album, Inheritance. I'm going to have a link again in the show notes over at catholicfoodie.com. But man, what an incredible, incredible album. It's all these these hymns. You know, these hymns that have been with the church, in the church for, in some cases, hundreds of years. And, uh, and she brings these, these hymns to life in a new way uh, through her particular gift of, of music. Uh, just, just incredible. If you haven't heard it yet, uh, it is available. It's on iTunes. Uh, you can download it if you're on Spotify or, or any of the other um well, I know Spotify for sure it's on there, but if you're on any of those other music services, uh, it, it, it's probably available there as well. Inheritance by Audrey Assad. I can't recommend it enough, especially in Lent. You know, as we, we roll through, uh, going toward the end here of Lent, we've got another couple of weeks and then we're rolling into the Holy Triduum, you know, Holy Week, the Holy Triduum, which is are the three holiest days of the year as we usher in this great mystery, this great mystery of faith 
faith in the resurrection. That's something that, 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 that changes everything, right? It changes everything, the resurrection. This is one of those things where Paul says, if we don't, you know, the St. Paul says, if we don't believe in the resurrection, then our faith is nothing, right? We're, we're the most pathetic <laughs> of human beings. If, if we do what we say we do here as Christians and yet don't believe in the resurrection, resurrection changed at all. That someone who had died, who was dead, came back to life and, and uh, it, it's just, it's glorified, right? This glorified body, it, it really makes or breaks our faith, the resurrection. So an incredible mystery, beautiful, beautiful mystery. And we, we celebrate that every year at Easter time. So very exciting. We're coming up on that. A lot of good things that we can talk about between now and then. Uh, I love the whole process of Lent, of especially moving into Holy Week and, and the things that we do as a family every year. Uh, it, not you know a family here in our house, but also in our parish family. I want to share some of that stuff with you as we move into Holy Week and then into uh, Easter. And uh, once we get into the Easter season, it is just awesome. Awesome. Springtime, a lot of good things going on as far as uh, opportunities to gather together with friends and family for food events, you know, uh, festivals that we have here in the springtime in South Louisiana, but also uh, leading up to the great celebration of Pentecost. And uh, we'll talk more about that as we uh, move through these mysteries and these feasts of the church. Very exciting stuff. You know, I mentioned on Friday's show, I mentioned on Friday's show how, how, uh, how much joy I had uh, a couple of weeks back at the, the Los Angeles, uh, uh, Religious Education Congress uh, out in Anaheim, uh, California, getting to meet a lot of new people. I, I got to see friends that I never get to see except for at events like that. You know, when I'm traveling around in different places, uh, um, I got, I got to see Lisa Hendy again, Jared Dees. Uh, I, I went through a whole list of, of folks I got to see either again because I only see him at these kind of events or saw him for the first time, got to actually meet him in person for the first time. Went through a list of those on Friday's show. So if you if you missed that, you can always go back and listen to it. You can find it at catholicfoodie.com. All of the shows are cataloged there. They're available as podcasts. You can download them from iTunes or whatever podcatcher you use. They are MP3 files that are kind of uh, hosted there, saved over at catholicfoodie.com. So there's nothing lost. You know, if you miss something, there's, you know, leftovers are available, you know, a little, little goodie bag, you know, just go to catholicfoodie.com and you can listen to all the past shows. Some of those shows I don't want to listen to. They're really old and uh, back when I was first starting and wow, I can't even listen to those anymore. But if you want to listen to them, you can. They are available at catholicfoodie.com. And I mentioned to you that I had a really awesome little chance encounter uh, it was Divine Providence. It wasn't really chance. Uh, meeting Peggy Normandon. She's got a, a radio show with EWTN uh, Radio uh, called Call Me Catholic. And it just so happens that she was having uh, Father Leo Paddling Hug of Grace Before Meals on the show with her and uh, that morning. It was a Saturday morning. And... Um, she was going to be talking about food, Catholic food websites. And we just happened to bump into each other at the Congress. And she was like, oh my goodness, you know, I can't believe I'm meeting you right here. I'm about to go do my show and I'm going to be talking about you because I have the top five Catholic food websites and, and you're number three on the list. And I'm like, wow, that's, that's awesome. I'm excited to hear about that. And, and so I, I was able to stay there just for a little bit, but I, had, I got pulled away. I didn't get to hear the broadcast. However, her broadcast is available as a podcast. I'm going to put a link in the show notes, as always, at catholicfoodie.com. But I do want to play this little clip. This was just so exciting for me to hear, and I wanted to share this with you. This is what she had to say about uh, catholicfoodie.com. Let's take a listen. Number three is catholicfoodie.com. Now, you have got to check this site out. Jeff Young is the founder and producer of The Catholic Foodie, and he was born and raised in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Ah. He lives in um, New Orleans right now. So, you know, it's got to be colorful. It's going to be spirited. It's going to be a very animated um, treatment of food and recipes. His slogan is where food meets faith. Lots of pictures, lots of recipes, and he, and he has podcasts, so ah. you can access all of this at his site. Cool. You know, I got to tell you, as an aside, it was really funny. I was walking around the Congress convention floor this morning, and I was talking to some friends, and they said, oh, have you met um, this 
this man named Jeff Young. And I said, wait, Jeff Young? The Catholic booty? I just, I just finished completing my list of top five Catholic food websites and you were on it. So I was hoping he was hanging around here for a while. I was going to say, hey, give him a shout out. But you can go to his website, catholicfoodie.com. He's published a book called Around the Table with Catholic Foodie. He speaks. He's got a real following and his website is definitely worth checking out. Can you believe there's this many websites that just deal with Catholic food habits. That is amazing. Well, you're, you're giving us an education this morning. Yeah. So. Well, it only goes to prove how interesting and diverse Catholics are. Nobody said we don't like to have a good time that's and sit right. down to a good meal. Okay. That's right. So, so that's that's what she had to say, Peggy Normandon. Uh, it was just a, such a pleasure to meet her. And it was. It was one of those chance encounters, but it really wasn't chance. Obviously, right? God's involved. It was divine providence. It was divine providence. And it was it was such a joy to meet uh, Father Leo in person as well. I mentioned that on Friday's show, uh, too. Again, links in the show notes over at catholicfoodie.com. And now, as we are coming to the close of the show, we just have a couple more minutes left. I do want to ask you a favor. I want to ask you a very simple favor to, to get in touch with me to uh, to give me a call. You, you know, you can always call the voice feedback line at 985-635-4974, 985-635-4974. That is a, uh, 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 an answering machine, essentially, where you can call, leave a message. It's a voice feedback line, and you can tell me what you think. You can uh, give me suggestions uh, on topics to cover. That's really what I want to hear from you about. I want to know, are, are there things that you want to hear about? What do you want to hear about as far as food and faith? Do you want more recipes? Do you want uh, d- d- restaurant reviews? You know, I'm kind of limited geographically. I know we've got about 1,600 restaurants in the Metro New Orleans area, uh, but but you know, I can't review restaurants like in Philadelphia, but I could do some here. <laughs> You know, is that what you would like to hear? I would love to know. I would love to know. I do have some awesome guests lined up uh, in the coming weeks. We've got folks who are going to be joining me. But do you have anything in particular that you would like to hear more about? Uh, That's what I want to know. That's your homework. You can always call, as I mentioned, the voice feedback line. Leave me a message, 985-635-4974. Or you can simply email me at jeff at catholicfoodie.com. Jeff at catholicfoodie.com and uh, and let me know what it is you would like to hear about here at the Catholic Foodie Show on the Catholic Foodie Show where food meets faith. I'm so glad that you joined me today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining me today on the show. And again, fantastic having Paul, Dr. Paul Thigpen with us. Uh, we are at the close. So until next time, bon appetit. <laughs>